Good morning. It's good to see everyone today. I hope everyone is doing well. I was recently asked to talk about uh, a verse that we studied in our daily videos, our daily devotional studios, or studies, pardon me, in Proverbs chapter 14, if you'd like to be turning over there. In Proverbs chapter 14, there's a single verse, and it illustrates a point. I think it's an important one. In Proverbs chapter 14, at verse 4, it says, Where no oxen are, the trough is clean, but much increase comes by the strength of an ox. Seems like a simple enough verse, I would suggest, on the surface, but I think there are things that we need to think about within the verse. And I would suggest, just like other, another verse about oxen, uh, a verse that we reference sometimes, the verse about, do not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. When Paul references that verse in the New Testament and he says, do you really think God is concerned about oxen? That there is a, a point being made, and I would suggest within this verse, do you really think it's just about those who have oxen? Or do you think there's a mentality, right? Do you think there's a mentality that uh, a mindset that sometimes it's tempting to have as it talks about a clean trough um, where there's no ox in the trough is clean but much strength comes much increase comes by the strength of an ox I'll ask it this way which one's better a clean trough or a dirty trough which one's better well it depends on if you're a seller or a user if you're a seller of troughs well, sellers usually like things clean and pristine. But if you're a user of troughs, then you understand perhaps a little bit more. Users know what comes from use because the bottom line is things get dirty. That's the point. Things get dirty. So what points might we make from the proverb? I would suggest one is this. Very simply, work is messy. That's just how it is. You go onto any, you go onto any working farm, working farm. <laughs> you go onto any working farm, and what are you going to find? Uh, you're going to find that you're going to find work going on. You go into any factory, and what are you going to find? Any working, <laughs> any place where people work, any place where people work. It's not a museum, is it? Right? It's not just for. It's not for display. What you're going to find is what we're, what we're talking about. Work is messy. Whatever the work is, it's on, on one level or another, it is messy. Now, I would suggest there are different kinds of messes, and some messes are not good. Uh, I will suggest that. For example, you have messes that come from neglect. Those are not good messes. Proverbs talks about this. Look over in chapter 24. Over in chapter 24, when Solomon talks about the broken down wall, Proverbs chapter 24 at verse 31, verse 30, I went by the field of the lazy man and by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding, and there it was, all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. So shall your poverty come like a prowler and your need like an armed man. He goes by this place that's been neglected and what would you say it is? It is a mess. Is it a good kind of mess? No, it's a bad kind of mess. Why is it such a mess? It's out of neglect. To illustrate this point, those of you who have ever had children, you go into, Lily's not feeling well today, so I'll pick on her. You go into, I go into Lily's room sometimes, and the only question is, was it an F4 tornado or an F5 tornado? It's the only question. It is an absolute mess from time to time. Now, why is it like that? Is it because there is an abundance of work going on, or is it out of neglect and just things that go along with neglect? And I'll say this, one of the things that go, that go hand in hand with neglect, that goes hand in hand with neglect, is chaos. God likes things done decently and in order. That is his nature, right? Decently and in order. God is not the author of confusion and chaos. 
Some people's lives are a manifestation of what's happening in their mind and heart. Because if you could see in their mind and heart, you would see chaos. And their lives manifest chaos. And it's a mess. It's just an absolute mess. Why? One of the reasons is neglect. That's one of the reasons. When we think about chaos and what it looks like with everything all over the place, that is not decently and in order. And to think about that idea, some, some messes are not good. Another mess that is not good is destruction. Let's come over to chapter 14. Over in chapter 14 again, at verse 1, chapter 14 at verse 1, says, The wise woman builds her house, but the foolish pulls it down with her hands. Some people just have destructive personalities. They just do. When you come up to the New Testament, there's a reason that those who are called heretics, and that sounds like a very religious word, and in some ways it is, what is a heretic? It is someone who is divisive. And there's a reason that the disciples were told, reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. They are warped and they are sinning. It actually uses that word warped. How warped do you have to be to pull down your own house? Have you ever known someone to actually do that? That they actually... I, I remember I grew up as a kid in Jamestown, those of you who know where Jamestown is, there's a kid I grew up with named Carl. And like, like a, you know the Southernism, well bless his heart. <laughs> Carl, when he got older, he got into trouble. And I remember driving by his house, he lived in town, we both lived in town. And he had sprayed graffiti on his own garage. Not someone else's garage, on his own garage and on his own father's car. And, and your, his dad, of course, was wondering, what are you thinking? <laughs> not, just, not just that you would destroy property, but that you would actually do damage to your own property. Why would you do that? It doesn't make any sense. It makes no more sense than a foolish woman who pulls down her own house with her own hands. It doesn't make any sense. Not all messes are good. Okay, There are messes out of neglect and there are messes out of destruction. And both those messes, if they're happening within the church, ought to be addressed. Because those messes are not good. But the sort of mess that an ox makes, that sort of mess... Work is messy. Work is messy. When we think about it, the clean trough mentality of verse 4, the clean trough mentality, it may, it may appeal to us, but we need to remember what we're doing. We are playing in the dirt. Okay, The parable of the soils. What do the soils represent? We're talking about people's hearts and people's minds. And I know within the parable of the sower, you don't see the sower playing around in the dirt. The sower just goes out to spread seed. Well, flip over to another parable, and you have the parable of the fig tree. When the fig tree was not doing what the fig tree should have been doing, what does the man say? Leave it alone. Let me dig around it. Let me fertilize it. Now, how messy is that? <laughs> that starts getting messy. We're talking about people's minds and hearts. Just think about Jesus being the great physician. And think about, my mother was a nurse, um, retired now. Worked up at Methodist in Indy, worked in Danville, worked for a little bit, I believe, um, Plainfield, or not Plainfield, outside of Greencastle. Anyway, she talks about one of the most amazing, one of the most amazing days um, in the OR was when the patient was having heart surgery and the doctor as they were actually having to get under the heart. And the doctor had her actually hold this man's heart in her hands and elevate it while the doctor got underneath it. So there she is holding, holding his heart in her hands. Sound amazing? 
does it sound messy? <laughs> that's what we're messing with. That's what, that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with people's hearts and minds. And it is a messy undertaking. All work is messy. We all want the trough to be perfectly clean all the time. We don't realize that much increase comes by the strength of an ox. But it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get messy. But when we look at it, we ask ourselves the question, well, what's the point of a trough? Right? Because that's, that's the verse. Okay, where there's no oxen, the trough is clean. Okay. <laughs> All right, where there's no oxen, it stays clean. What's the point of having the trough then if you don't have an oxen? What's the point? It, and it, there is no point when it really comes down, comes down to it. Why have a trough but not use it? I want you to think about different names. I actually come to Ecclesiastes first. Um, yeah, well, the passage in Ecclesiastes, this idea, before we get to something else. Come over to Ecclesiastes. The idea of having things that serve no purpose. That mentality of having things that serve no purpose. That leads to the mentality of hoarding, right? You hoard things, but you don't use them. Ecclesiastes 5 at verse 13. There is a severe evil which I have seen under the sun, riches kept for their owner to his hurt. Why have riches if you're not going to use them? Why? <laughs> what's, what's the point just to collect? I got news for you. You're going to die at some point, and then whose are those things going to be? Scripture makes that point. What's the point of having a trough but not using it? What's the point? It just doesn't make sense. Now, the point I was alluding to a moment ago. Think about, in Scripture, different names or monikers for the church. Different titles given to the church, if you want to use that word. When you look at those, at those different names for the church, each one is inferring something, I, I would suggest. When we look at the word flock, Right? The church is called a flock. Okay, so what does that conjure up in our minds? What's the inference? What could you think about? Jesus is the good shepherd. He says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Those ideas are a part of the church is the flock. We could talk about Jews and Gentiles. When the Lord was talking to the Jews and he says, other sheep I have which are not of this fold, I'm going to get them. They're going to be one flock. All right? So we could talk about different things concerning the flock. The church, though, is also called the bride of Christ. What does, what's the inference from the bride of Christ? What things would you think about? You would think about love. You would think about commitment. You would think about a helper, comparable. What about the church itself? Right? The word church, literally the called out. All right, well, if you're called out from something, you are called out to something. You could also talk about being called out to do something. All of that is within the church, the called out. Abraham, Abram, before his name was changed, was called out. He was called out from, and he was called out to. All of that goes into the church. Church is called the assembly. That one should be pretty easy. What does that mean? What does that mean? Do not forsake the assembling of themselves together. Oh, he quoted the verse again. <laughs> I'll give another verse to you. Then Paul was with the disciples in Jerusalem, and he was with them going in and going out. He was with them going in and going out. Might be coming in and going out. You might think about that. He was with them coming in and going out. Dwell on that one. The church is called the body. Now, what does that infer? We'll say this. As we think about the body, what does the body do? What does anybody's body do? When we have people, when we have our own brethren who have had surgery, and their bodies, their bodies have failed them, Ken, I'll ask you, how how nice is it to be how nice is it to be able to do some of the things that you've wanted to do for a long time? 
Pretty nice. What do we what is the body for? The body is for doing. We do things with our body. What is the body as the church? What is the body for? It is for work. The Lord's the Lord's body. What is the point of having a body if you're not going to use it? What's the point of having a body if it's, if it's not going to work? It's just pointless. It is just as pointless to have a body that does not work. It is just as pointless as having a trough without any oxen. What is the point? Well, it sure is clean. Congratulations. What are you going to do? Start collecting troughs? Put them up on a mantle somewhere and just look at them and say, Oh, that's the best trough I've ever had. Really? Did you ever use it? No, it's not really for that. It's just to look at. What? What's the point of having a body if it is not for work? When we think about what we were created for, Ephesians chapter 2, right? By grace, saved through faith, created for good works. What were we created for? To work. And to work that which is good, what God has for us. That's what we were created for. And work is messy. Work is messy. But it's worth it. It's worth it. And that's, that's the point of the passage. It says, much increase comes by the strength of an ox. So the question is, do you want to increase? That's, that's really the question. Is that not the point of the oxen? For increase, when we think about it, a clean trough better be put to use because I can tell you the owner, as you think about this analogy, the owner of the clean trough, the whole time that that trough is clean, what is he doing? Right? Is he consuming his goods? Is he consuming his grain? Right, as he has that clean trough and he has no oxen, he has he has no grain coming in to the barn. But there's grain going out of the barn because he's consuming. That's what we do as as you think about it. You might consider it. His stores are decreasing. So what he needs to do is he needs to work to provide for himself, to provide for his family, and to provide for others. We know in Proverbs 13, verse 22, back just a little bit, a few verses, Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. That idea of leaving an inheritance to your grandchildren. Hopefully you don't think we're just talking about money. <laughs> Hopefully you don't think we're, we're talking about covetousness and, and things like that, because that's really not what we're talking about about any more than we're talking about literal animals. That's not what we're talking about. It is about working. It is about working for our own benefit and for the benefit of others. It is tempting, I would suggest, to get into a rut. It's, it's tempting in a rut. Hopefully you're, you might be familiar. You know what a rut is? You ever hear the old quote? I don't know how the quote is. Chuck's heard it. Chuck's smiling. A rut is just a grave with the ends knocked out of it. That's what a rut is. It's tempting to, to get in a rut because that way the trough stays clean. Right? The trough stays clean. Now, I want you to think about a, a few different analogies. Envision yourself on a boat. Maybe it's a small boat. And you don't want that boat to capsize, I would assume. So what is the surest way to make sure the boat doesn't capsize? Don't move. And if you're as large as I am, don't you dare move. Right? You hold perfectly still. Don't move. Don't cause trouble. Don't move. And you won't capsize. You also won't get to the other side of the lake. In order to make any sort of progress, in order to go anywhere at some point, what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to move. In order to get anywhere at some point, you're going to have to make some waves. You can remain perfectly still. We can remain perfectly still 
and we will go nowhere. That's what it comes down to. We can have the cleanest trough, right? We'll never increase. Much, much increase comes by the strength of an oxen. At some point, you have to make some waves. At some point, it's fine to clean out the trough, right? All troughs need cleaned out from time to time. But at some point, what do you have to do with the trough? You got to fill it back up, and you got to use it. You got to use it. It's not a museum piece. At some point, to come up to the Gospels, when Jesus first, when when Jesus comes on the scene to Peter, James, and John and Andrew, and there they are, and what are they doing? What are they doing? I know what they'd been doing. They'd been fishing all night. But when he finds them, what, when he comes upon them, there they were washing and mending their nets. Now, is it necessary to wash and mend your nets? Yeah, probably so. <laughs> you don't want your nets to break down. You don't want the algae to build up on them. You don't want them to, to deteriorate. Frankly, a fisherman is just as good as his net, uh, I would suggest. So it's fine to wash and mend the nets, but at some point, what are you going to have to do with those nets? At some point, you're going to have to use them. You can't just, we cannot just spend all our time washing and mending nets. As we think about much increase comes through the strength of an ox, and we think about the temptation of having a clean trough, I'll simply ask you, I'll simply ask you, do we want this church to grow or not? That is a simple question. Do we want this church to grow or not? Because I got, I got news for you, and I know this is going to be a big news flash. What are the odds that there's another funeral before the end of the year? What are the odds? You might take a look around. How about next year, 2022? Right? How about in the next five years? How many funerals do you think there will be here in the next five years? Not to be too, oh, I hate to be, I don't know what the word is, morbid, perhaps. Some funerals will be expected. Some funerals might not be expected. How many funerals will, the, will there be over the next five to ten years? Do you want the church to grow or not? Do you want the church to be here, not just for our generation, but for generations coming up? Do you want the church to be here? Or do you want it to just fritter away? Right? Just as, just as people go on to their reward, do you want to increase or not? If you want to increase, what is it going to take? It's going to take work. That's what it's going to take. Everyone wants to have a clean trough, but much increase comes by the strength of an ox, and work is messy. So, on come the excuses. But, 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 <laughs> right? People have all sorts of excuses for not wanting to work. To think about it, why might, why might a person be hesitant about buying an ox? Why might a person hesitate? Well, that's, I'm going to have to feed the ox, right? <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to feed the ox. What is that called? That's called an investment. You're going to have to, you're going to have to feed the ox. Well, yeah, but, and as you think about investments, it's a good investment. It's worth it. So don't make the, don't try to excuse it away of saying, well, yeah, but it's going to require me to take care of something else. Yeah, that's, that's what work takes. Another excuse might be, well, yeah, but then I'll have to clean up after the ox. So we've dealt with one end of the ox, and now we have to deal with the other end of the ox. You mean you're actually going to have to muck out the stalls? Right? You mean you're actually going to have to deal with it? Yeah, you're actually going to have to deal with that. It's part of it. You're going to have to clean up after the ox. But is it worth it? Is it worth it? 
Well, it depends on if you want increase or not. Another excuse. Well, yeah, but I'll, I'll use a dog for an example. Everyone always says, oh, John, you need to get a dog. It's a little bit easier now just because we're closer to family. But when we were living down south, oh, John, you need to get a dog, right? Every kid needs to have a dog growing up. No one ever suggested we get a cat. I appreciate that. But they, oh, John, you need to get a dog. And we would always say, well, yeah, but who's going to take care of the dog when we're gone? Well, right? Well, what if, what if the dog gets sick? Well, dogs are expensive. Well, <laughs> right? There, there, are, there are these excuses. Well, what if something happens? As we think about the church, right? As we think about increase. Well, well yeah, but... But what if this happens? What if that happens? What if these happen? What if those happen? What if the person does this? What if the person does that? I got news for you. It's going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen. All right? Things happen. Messes happen. It's a part of growth. It is a part of increase. To think about the analogy, oh, well, I'm going to have to feed the ox. It's worth it. I'm going to have to clean up after the ox. It's worth it. Well, what if the ox gets sick? Guess what? It's going to get sick. Well, what if the ox, you know, I've never had an ox before, so I, it's, it's worth it, right? We're talking about work. For those who are in the excuse business, you know what is said. For those who are in the excuse business, any excuse will do. And as we think about making excuses to not work, Sadly, the mentality, it's, it's the craziest thing. We get fr I think a lot of people are frustrated right now in the business world because a lot of businesses are having trouble hiring people. Why are businesses having trouble hiring people? Why is that? <laughs> right? And, and when we think about it, and when we're honest with with what we see going on, why would I go work for minimum wage when the government will pay me to not work? And we have that strange thing where you have people saying, well, I don't want to work. I'll just let the government take care of me. Really? You think the government will do a good job of taking care of you? But that's, that's why a lot of people are frustrated right now, because a lot of a lot of individuals have the mentality of, well, I'll just let the government take care of me. We're thankful for, for government programs and things like that that help in time of need. We're thankful for all those things. But the mentality of, eh, I'm not going to work. I'll just, let, I'll just let the government take care of me. Eh, I'm not going to work. I'll just, I'll just live off my parents until I'm 45. Eh, I won't work. I'll just mooch off my friends. Eh, I won't. You don't think that same mentality affects the church? I won't work, right? I don't, I don't want to do that. I'll let the elders do that. I don't, I don't want to do that. I'll let the deacons do that. I don't want to do that. I'll let the preacher do that. I don't really want to get that involved with the church. I'll let everybody else handle that. Well, do you want to increase or not? As, as you think about it, a lot of folks sometimes, I shouldn't say a lot of folks, but some folks have, have that mentality of just let someone else do it. And we'll say this concerning work, oxen are messy. I'm saying they are messy. You can enjoy your clean trough, but you won't increase. You won't increase. So as we think about excuses for work, what we recognize really is we recognize that we need to labor for the Lord. And that brings us to our scripture reading. Come over to Matthew, where Steve read a few minutes ago. We're in Matthew chapter 11. In Matthew chapter 11, we have the, the verses that so many are familiar with. Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
You know, as you look at that image up on the screen, you have the, the double yoke. And I've, I've never settled for sure. When the Lord says, take my yoke upon you, does that put him in the driver's seat or does that put him yoked together with us? I'm not sure, but for the sake of this analogy, consider that the other one in the yoke is not the Lord, but the Lord is the one um, driving us. Another reason that sometimes people do not work is they, they don't like the one or ones that they're yoked with. Right? Another reason that people don't work is because they don't like working with someone. That's another reason that people don't work. They don't want to work with someone or someones. And I'll say this to answer that. Jesus said a whole lot about the least of these, my brethren. And if folks, if folks look down their nose on their brethren, and if folks are not willing to work with their brethren, if folks are not willing to work with the church, here in this image of the, of the yoke, do you remember what was said to Saul of Tarsus? Saul, Saul. It's hard to kick against the goads, isn't it? If you're familiar with that picture of the goad, which is a, effectively a spike on a stick, usually, and if the animal would get out of line, then the owner, would, there would be a, there would, usually, sometimes it would be mounted, and the animal would kick against, kick against the goad, as it was. If the animal kept doing that, what would, ha what would happen to the animal? It would, it would wound it, and the wound would fester, and it would get infected, and the animal eventually would be no more. If brethren, if someone is not willing to work with their brethren, then we're back to that idea, and, and again, it's that attitude of, no, I don't want to work with them because I'm so much better than that ox. I'm so much better than that ox. That's divisiveness. That's what that is. That is a refusing to work with. And that's kicking against the goads. And it's, it's not good. What we need to do is what the passage says. We need to come to the Lord. And we need to take his yoke upon us. And we need to learn from him. He is gentle and lowly in heart, and we will find rest for our souls. It's interesting to look at that passage because what we see is we work before coming to the Lord. Right? He says, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. So you're laboring before you ever come to the Lord. You labor before you come to the Lord, and you labor after you come to the Lord. The question is, who are you laboring with and who are you laboring for? That's what it comes down to. Who are you laboring with, and what are you laboring for? And it's only with the Lord that we find, and you will find rest for your souls. Where there's no oxen, does the trough stay clean? <laughs> yeah, the trough stays clean, but no work gets done. No work gets done to consider it. His yoke, his yoke is made for us. How do you view work? How do you view work? You know, I think sometimes we have a negative view of work. And I would suggest perhaps we might have a negative view of work because of our life experience or life experiences. Raise your hand if you've ever had a bad boss. <laughs> right? Terry, you raised your hand back there. When you had a bad boss, how much did you and how much did you like going into work? Not at all. Sometimes those experiences sour us on the whole notion of work. And we think work is is just not something we're interested in. How much better is the Lord's yoke? Much increase comes by the strength of an ox. 
And in the analogy here of Matthew chapter 11, who's the ox? We are the ox. That's who we are. We don't think we're better than anybody else. We are working with one another. We are working for the Lord. And in doing that, we find rest for our souls. Back up to verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom his Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. So what has the Lord revealed to you? What has the Lord revealed? The, who the Son wills to, wills to reveal him. As we think about where the oxen are, and we think about the invitation, Maybe go ahead and switch it over. We're about to sing, Why Keep Jesus Waiting? Why do, why do people keep the Lord waiting? There's just no good reason for it. There's no good excuse for it. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day, as we think about it, we think we have to know so much to look at verse 29. We think we have to have everything figured out before we come to the Lord. That's not what the Lord said. The Lord says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. We learn from the Lord. We come to him with the, with the knowledge we have, and then we continue to learn. We continue to learn, and we know what we find. He's gentle. He's lowly. We find rest for our souls. The lesson is yours today. If you're here this morning and need to respond, being baptized into Christ, being baptized into the body of Christ, as it's, as it's called, being baptized for the remission of sins, the circumcision made without hands, God cutting away sin, just an amazing, an amazing thing. And as we come to him, we learn from him. And we learn how to work. And we learn, frankly, what really matters. The lesson is yours. If you're here and need to respond, please come. I'm always standing while we sing.